where do you see track and field's future going in regards to its popularity, its reach, um, and its growth? Yeah, in, you, in the US uh, and worldwide. I'm, you know, I can't really speak to worldwide because I don't fully understand um, or, or I'm not well versed, I guess, in what the meet directors are doing. I can say that having competed in Australia uh, and in Asia and, and in Europe, um, so I think that the, the populations there generally appreciate the subtle nuances of, of a distance race or um, appreciate, you know, how to put on a track meet. One thing I like to say is, is, is of all the meets I've competed at, and I've competed at hundreds of meets throughout the world, yeah. Zurich gets it. Zurich is the greatest non-championship meeting on the planet. And, and for two simple reasons. They allow alcohol and they allow gambling. And until American meet directors get that through their head, until American lawmakers allow gambling um, you know, in all 50 states, uh, it's just not going to be that popular. Can you imagine horse racing without alcohol and, and booze? Or sorry, without booze and gambling? Absolutely not. Horse racing would cease to exist without those two things. So why people think that you know millions of people are going to you know try to go watch a track meet without those two things? It's, it's very it's very similar. Uh, I think that right now, track and field is being force fed to the American public. In a in a manner or or in a in a package that the American people just don't want, they need the the, the powers that be or or the uh, meet directors need to totally reinvent the model, need to create a, a fun interactive two hour experience or three hour experience at the max where there's not a lot of dead time running around setting up hurdles where there's constantly something going on where people can have a beer in their hand uh, and 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 ideally put five or ten dollars down on their favorite athlete. That's that's how you reinvent track and field for the masses. Yeah, nice. And so on to Rio, um, you know, what were your thoughts firstly of the coverage? Um, and then let's go in, what what was your uh, your favorite, uh, favorite Rio moment there? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it was one of those things where we're bombarded with reports going into the games that this will be the worst Olympics ever, they'll never be finished on time, the plumbing won't work and the mosquitoes yeah. are going to eat everyone alive. And of course it was all just talk, you know, a lot of talk and, and I, it, the, the games went off very successfully yeah. um, as I assumed that they would. Cause I've seen this now how many times when they said Athens would never be ready, when they said Beijing would never be ready. And, and uh, you know, the, the IOC is, is filthy rich <laughs> and, uh, and the, the Olympic rings are the most widely recognized brand in the world because they always Put on a great show, and once again they did it again in Rio. Um, I didn't watch a ton of the events. Uh, I was I was pretty busy working on Run Gum, yeah. but I would say you know I watched a lot of the track and field moments, and obviously for me, uh, mid distance is really important. And I would say that watching our U.S. middle distance runners bring home so many medals that was a highlight for me. I mean, I think we won four, five, six medals in the middle distances. It was fantastic. Clayton Murphy. Um, you know, winning a medal in the 800, Matt Centrowitz winning gold. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's just so many moments. It's it's almost overwhelming how how good our team performed. Yeah, and and do you think this will have an impact on the sport in in the U.S.? Just you know, the youngsters may have seen you know Centro just just hammer it out there and think oh, I want to do that one day. I believe I can do it. You know, it's this is these other yeah. U.S. guys are doing this. It. Is, this is the tragic part: is you're going to have these youngsters say, "I want to do that. I want to be that person." But I don't know if in 10 years or 15 years when they're old enough to have a chance at a medal, if there's going to be a sport waiting for them. Mm -hmm. um, the way that our national governing body, USATF, mis mismanages our, our team and the way they mismanage uh, development of the sport in America, <laughs> there may not be a sport waiting for them in 10 years. Yeah, we're all talking about, you know, if, you, if there wasn't a sport, Everest. I've, I've read the article. Will you conquer it? Why, how, and when? So here's an interesting statistic for you. Yeah. No human has ever run a sub four minute mile and summited Everest. No. Nice. I've, I've already gone under four, <laughs> uh, which is a, you know, a very big challenge. But yeah. I, I actually grew up as a mountaineer climbing in central Idaho. So I kind of want to be that guy. No, I don't kind of want to be that. I want to be that guy, and I plan yeah. on being that guy. I, I need I know I need to crawl before I, I run and so I'm picking off um, lower summits throughout the world right now and uh, have climbed some, some pretty major summits this last summer 
I'll work my way up towards Everest. And I don't know if it's going to happen in two years or five years or 10 years, but uh, my, my mountaineering skills are growing and, uh, and I'm just going to continue to pick off, you know, more and more intense and, and complicated summits uh, between now and then. Nice. Is there an adrenaline factor in that for you? I mean, it's, it's obviously exceptionally dangerous yeah. the higher the peak. Um, yeah. It's silly. You know, it's not silly, but it's, it's, it's such a different feeling than, than running. Running is a flood of adrenaline and extreme and uh, chaotic for two, you know a minute and 45 seconds. And when you're climbing one of these mountains, for, for example, for Everest, you're going to be on the mountain for six weeks. Yeah. So it, it's not it's not the same feeling of adrenaline, but it is a uh, it's this feeling of life or death. And every single thing that you do up there is is not you know you take your mittens off. That's a life or death situation. Yeah. If those mittens fall and and go down the mountain and you're left without without gloves, there's a very good chance you're going to die. Yeah. But. So you're sitting there just taking your gloves off and watching them so carefully and clipping them onto your carabiner, and you're thinking to yourself, I cannot afford to let these gloves fall. I mean, seriously, every single thing that you do has repercussions up there, and, and it causes you to have this level of focus that is that I've never found anywhere else um, doing anything else in the world uh, for, for days at a time. Every move that you make is calculated and about conserving energy, conserving heat, uh, and making sure that you you move up and down uh, in elevation safely. It's 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 almost uh, it's almost meditative uh, in that way that all of the all of the other outside issues in the world totally go away out of necessity, so that every bit of your brain processing power can be put towards one goal. Nice, nice, totally in the moment. So. You know, on that as well, kind of a bit more relaxed. So, where are you most at peace in life? You know, how do you unwind? You know, for me, I, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of high strung. Um, you know, people always joke. You know, I must be chewing ten packs of Rangam a day because I seem so <laughs> hyper. <laughs> That's just me. I just wound tight. So I need to be doing stuff. I I feel that the perfect day is a day spent where I'm challenged both both mentally and physically, and you know, I, I feel that I've got this perfect balance right now uh, where I'm training for, for mountaineering and for track races, but I'm also working on my company Run Gum. And my days are typically spent working from about 7 to 9 a.m. on Run Gum. Yeah. Then I'll go to practice from 9 to noon um, and come home and work again from about 1 to 5 before my secondary uh, run or swim or lift. And it's just this it's just really great way to spend a day. Uh, where I feel physically challenged and mentally stimulated through working on run gum, and that's how I'd like to spend the rest of my life. Is just is just uh, as an entrepreneur who uh, who works at businesses that I'm passionate about, businesses that give back to the community, um, and also you know tackling some of these athletic goals that I've set for myself. Look, um, a few random questions then. So, do you get recognized on the the street much? It depends on where I'm at. If I'm in Eugene, Oregon, or Boise, Idaho, you know, places that have been home to me, I do probably, I mean, not probably, but maybe, uh, you know, once a day, someone says, hey, you know, great running, or it's been fun to follow your career. Oh, nice. Um, if, if I'm here in Seattle, you know, it's a big city, four million people, I don't get recognized as much. Uh, but, you know, if I'm out on the running trails, uh, the Burke Gilman or, or Green Lake, um, people will wave and, and come say hi. And I love that. It really it means a lot to me that people have followed my career and, and yeah. that they, especially when they say they want me to keep running. You know, at 32, almost 33, you know, I, I, I don't want to be the old guy out there who doesn't know when to quit. But when people say, Nick, you got to run one more year, it makes it all that e easier for me to tell Brooks, yeah, let's do this. Nice. And look, at college or, or when, when was the moment that you just, you committed to running? Is there a definitive moment? Yeah, actually, it is a very definitive moment. Um, between my junior and senior year, I, I, I was studying biochemistry and I wanted to go on to medical school, but I was also running really well. I'd won five national titles at that point. So I'm kind of 21 years of age and thinking I've only got one more year to goof around and be a college kid, but I need to figure out which way my life's going. Am I going to run or am I going to go to medical school? And I decided, you know, I, I wanted to take the chance. I wanted to see how good I could be at running. And me and a buddy packed up our bags and moved to central Mexico and lived in a city called Toluca at 9,000 feet for 10 weeks. And the idea was that we were going to train like pros. We were going to eat, sleep, and live every moment of our life uh, trying to be the best runners that we could be. 
Um, I went up weighing 170 pounds and came down weighing 150 pounds. I went up a 148 guy and came down a 145 guy. So that was the moment that I decided to invest everything I had into running and ultimately is, is what launched my professional running career. It's fantastic. So you, you, bas- you lived the running dream there and it worked. Yeah, I did. Very cool. Um, so look, what, what's one of your, uh, or your favorite place or places to run in the world? You might know exactly what I'm talking about. It's Narrabeen. I knew you were going to say favorite that. Favorite place nice. in the entire world to train. Nice. And you you, you train there with uh, Rent, Lachlan Renshaw a bit. That's correct, isn't yep. it? Yep. Yeah. The Wrench. Nice. So Lockie lives, Lockie lives only a few miles away from Narrabeen. Uh, and it is, it is just exactly what you want when you're training. It's got a six-mile dirt path around a beautiful lagoon. It's got a track. It's got a weight room. Uh, perfect weather. Uh, I mean, literally everything that you want to train is in one spot, and and when you wrap up your training, you can go down to the ocean and and soak your legs and get a great uh, coffee and some eggs. And I spent six weeks down there training with Lockie, and uh, I've trained all over the world. And and if I had to spend six weeks training anywhere in the world, I'd choose Narrabeen Lagoon. That's awesome. Great answer. Great answer. Well, that that was that was the second last question. What's your favorite place to run in Australia? But uh, yeah, you got it. Have you been to um, Have you been to Melbourne? Um, I have, yeah. yeah. And run the tans pretty cool. You know, five or six o'clock in the afternoon when everyone gets off work and you've got several thousand people running around the tan. That was always a great yeah. experience. Yeah, nice. Um, the next run I need to do is Kosciuszko, though. Yeah, yeah, that's. I got to tackle that one. Yeah, that'll be a good one. That'll be a good one. Yeah, a little bit of a run hike. When you do the seven summits, um, you actually end up climbing eight mountains because. In the mountaineering community, there's this big disagreement on what is the tallest mountain uh, in the oceanic area. So yeah. some would say Kosciuszko. They say Australia is, a, is an island, but it's a continent, and that Kosciuszko is the tallest point. Yeah. But others argue that Papua New Guinea sits on this, the same tectonic plate and that uh, the Karstens Pyramid on Punka Jaya uh, is actually the tallest mountain in that area. So most mountaineers end up doing both. Nice. And you're going to do both. That's the plan. So, so talking about all the the world's biggest summits, is this is this the end goal? Not just Everest. Is it like K two? Is that on the cards? So K K two is um, it's not one of the seven summits. It is one of the most difficult mountains yeah. in the world to climb. Uh, you know, right now the goal that I set for myself when I was a kid was to climb the seven summits, the tallest mountain on every continent. K two is not on that list, yeah. but I have a feeling if I'm able to climb those seven summits. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to set new goals. Um, that's kind of just the way track and field people are wired. And K2 may pop on the list at some point. Oh, don't forget your run gum. you got to have run gum. I'll tell you what, I was climbing Mount Baker, um, yeah. one of the most heavily glaciated peaks in, in America, um, last month. And you can't pack up Red Bulls. You're not going to pack up five-hour energies. But these packs of run gum weigh almost nothing. And when you're climbing 24 hours at a time, you know, waking up in the middle of the night for alpine summiting, um, people were offering me $20 a pack for run gum up there. And I was just laughing. I'm like, you guys, you know, we sell it online, rungum.com, a buck fifty a pack. You know, load up. It's perfect for runners, cyclists, yeah. mountaineers, hikers, fishermen. Anyone that wants an immediate boost of energy and focus – can utilize run gum and uh, I, I just I, I've been honored um, at how many people have, have come to us and say how, that where that where run gum has been you know helpful in their life whether it's a doctor working a late hour shift um, you know Uber drivers driving around the clock uh, students studying for finals so many people have found that run gum can can be very helpful and enhance their performance so we're just going to keep telling everybody about our product and uh, keep sharing our, our story online. Um, we're on social at RunGum. And uh, I'd like to thank you guys for letting me talk about it a little bit here. Oh, man, it's an absolute pleasure. Look, your motivations, your intentions, they're, they're phenomenal. They're obviously all for the sport. And, um, you know, that, that, that relates through in, in the products you create. So I'd recommend that to thank anyone. You. Uh, it's thank great. you. Thank you very much, Nick. Thanks, guys. Cheers, man. Have a good one. You too. Bye.